It's my pleasure to welcome this afternoon Andrea Stuhlmuller, uh, who's going to be talking to us on delegating open-ended cognitive work. So Andrea's founded ORT, which is a non-profit research lab that designs and tests mechanisms for using machine learning to support thinking and reflection. Before ORT, Andreas was a postdoctoral researcher in Noah Goodman's com Computational Cognitive Science Lab at Stanford. He co-created WebPPL, a programming language for probabilistic machine learning. He holds a PhD in Cognitive Science from MIT. If you'd like to ask Andreas a question, please uh, submit it via the Bizabo app, um, and we can do the Q&A after this session. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Andreas to the stage. Hi. Um, I'll be talking about delegating open-ended cognitive work today, a problem that I think is really important. Let's start right with the central problem. So suppose you are currently wearing glasses, as many of you are, and suppose you're thinking, should I get laser eye surgery or should I continue wearing my glasses? And imagine you're trying to get a really good answer to the question, like, no, the risks outweigh the possible benefits, for example, could be such an answer. An answer that takes into account your preferences, but also the relevant facts about the world, um, such as like what the actual complications could be or like what the likely consequences are. Um, and imagine that there are a lot of experts in the world who could in principle help you with that question. So there are people who have the role of medical knowledge, um, there are people on the internet maybe who have um, the ability to help you think through that question. Maybe there's machine learning algorithms that have relevant knowledge. But here's the key part. Um, imagine that those experts don't intrinsically intrinsically care about you. Imagine that those experts only care about some score you assign at the end when they give you an answer. So they give you an answer and then you either decide, this is how much I'm gonna pay you for that answer, or here's like in the case of machine learning, here's a reward signal that I assigned to you. And the experts really only care about that number. They wanna maximize that number. The key question, the question I wanna talk about today is, can you somehow design a mechanism that arranges your interaction with those experts such that those experts are trying to be really helpful to you such that they're as helpful to you as an expert who intrinsically cares about you. That's the problem. So in this talk, I want to first say a little bit more about what that problem is. Then I'll talk about why I think it's really important, why it's hard, and why I still think it might be tractable. I'll start with um, the big picture, but at the end I'll get to a demo. So what do I mean by open-ended cognitive work? That's easiest to explain if I say what I don't mean. So, a thing I don't mean is tasks like uh, winning a game of Go or increasing a company's revenue or persuading someone to buy a book. Like for those tasks, you can just look at the outcome and it's pretty easy to tell whether the goal has been accomplished or not. So um, you look at did I win the game of Go? Did the co company's revenue go up or not? Did Bob buy the book or not? Those are easy. Contrast those with open-ended tasks. So designing a great board game or increasing the value a company creates for the world or finding a book that is helpful to someone for those tasks, figuring out what it even means to do well is the key part of the task. So what does it mean to design a great board game? Well, it should be fun, but also facilitate maybe social interactions. What does it mean to facilitate social interactions? Well, it's complicated. Likewise, increase the value a company creates uh, for the world. Well, it depends on what the company can even do. What are the consequences of their actions? Some of them are potentially very long run. So those are difficult tasks to do really well at. Okay. Uh, how can we solve such tasks? Well, uh, we can think about how to solve any task and then just special case it. Here's the simple two-step <laughs> recipe. Uh, first, we find experts who can solve the problem we're trying to solve in principle. Uh, and then the second step, so those experts can be human or machine. In the second step, then we create robust incentives for those experts to solve your problem. That's how easy it is. Uh, <laughs> All right, and again, incentives. By incentives, I mean like something like dollars or a reward signal that you assign to those experts in the end. There are already a lot of experts in the world, and people in AI and machine learning are working on creating more experts. So in this talk, I really want to focus on the second part. How can you create robust incentives for experts to solve your problem? All right. We can think about the different um, kind of instances of this problem. So there's one instance that is delegation to human experts. Um, that has some like, kind of complications that are specific to human experts. Like human experts are pretty heterogeneous, different people have different knowledge. People in fact actually care about many things besides just dollars. Uh, if you want to extract knowledge from people, maybe you need specific user interfaces to make that work well. So those are human specific factors. 
And then there's machine-specific factors. If you try to delegate open-ended tasks to machine learning agents, uh, you want to think about things like, well, what's a good agent architecture for that setting? Uh, what data sets do I even need to collect for these sorts of tasks? And uh, like, then there's more esoteric things like, well, inner alignment problems, like do things go wrong for reasons that are due to the nature of ML training? And in this task, uh, sorry, in this talk, I really want to focus on kind of the overlap between those two. There's a shared mechanism design problem where you kind of take a step back and you say, um, what can we do if we don't make assumptions about the internals of experts? If you just say, those experts are trying to maximize a score, but we don't really want to assume anything else about them. I think in the end, we will have to assume more about those experts. I think you can't totally treat them as a black box, but I think it's a good starting point to think about what mechanisms you can design if you make as few assumptions as possible. All right, I've talked about what the problem is. Why is it important? Um, we can think about what happens if we don't solve it. I think for human experts, it's more or less business as usual. So in the world, there's a lot of principal agent problems related to cognitive work. For example, imagine you're an academic funder and you're giving money to a university to study, say, um, like what's the best way to treat cancer? There are researchers at the university, they're gonna do things uh, that are related to that problem, but they're not exactly aligned with your incentives. So you, you care about figuring out the answer to that problem. Uh, researchers also care about things like looking impressive or writing papers or getting citations. On the machine learning side, um, at the moment, machine learning can only really solve closed problems. So problems where you can easily specify what the metric is or how, where you can easily specify like what it means to do well on the problem. But those problems are not the things we ultimately care about. They're proxies for the things we ultimately care about. This is not too bad right now. I guess it's kind of bad if you look at things like Facebook where we maximize, say, the amount of attention you spend on the feed instead of the value that the feed creates for you. But in the long run, the gap between those proxies and the things we actually care about could be quite large. If the problem is solved, um, we could get much better at scaling up thinking on open-ended tasks. So to, to give just one more example, another open-ended task is, what causes should I support? If you could somehow create a mechanism such that we can turn money into kind of aligned thinking on that question, that would be really great. Uh, that's again on the human side. On the machine learning side, imagine like, what would it look like to make as much progress on open-ended questions using machine learning for open-ended questions as we've had progress for other tasks. So over the last five years or so, there has been a huge amount of progress on using machine learning for tasks like generate realistic looking faces, like here from the left to the right. Um, if you could, in the future, make as much progress on using machine learning for open-ended tasks, like helping uh, us think through, like what causes should we support, uh, that would be really good. In the long run, we could potentially get like, so much more thinking done on those questions than we have so far, um, that it would be a kind of uh, a qualitative change. All right. I've talked about what the problem is and why it's important. If it's so important, then why hasn't it been solved yet? What makes it hard? We can think about that in the context of the example I had on the previous slide, um, what causes should I support? In that example, I, I guess we all know, like, it's very hard to tell what interventions are good. You need to, like, sometimes it takes 10 years or longer for outcomes to come about. And even then, um, looking at the outcomes doesn't easily tell you whether those outcomes are good or not. There's like some interpretation that needs to be going on that can be quite hard. Um, so outcomes can be far off, can be difficult to interpret. And what that means is, you need to evaluate the process and the arguments that were used to generate recommendations. You can't just kind of look at the results or look at the recommendations themselves. You can't just check the results. On the other hand, um, evaluating the process and arguments is also not that easy because uh, the whole point of delegation is you give the task to someone else who knows much more than you do and can do much more reasoning than you do. Um, and so, uh, because like those experts that you give your task to, they have all the knowledge and reasoning capacity. Because of that, you can't just check the full reasoning either. So you're kind of in this tricky situation where you can't just check the results, you can't just check the reasoning, you need to do something else. All right, what can you do? What does it take to create good incentives in that setting? We can think about, um, again, the question we had at the very beginning, should I get laser eye surgery or wear glasses? So that, that's kind of a big question that is hard to evaluate. And by hard to evaluate, I mean, um, you can't tell if you get different answers, which answer is better. So you might get one answer, which is like, no, the risk of the complications outweighs the possible benefits. Another answer is yes, over a 10-year period, the surgery will pay back and avoid costs and save time. And those, like on the face of it, those look about, about equally good to you. You can't tell which is better. 
But then there are other questions, um, but like what factors for this decision are discussed in the 10 most relevant Reddit posts. For those questions, if you get candidate answers, like one candidate answer could be, well, it's appearance, cost, risk of complications. Another is, it's like fraud and cancer risk. For those answers, you in fact can do the evaluation. So you can just look at like, what do the posts say? Which of those is a better summary? And you can pick one of those answers. So the thing that it takes to create good incentives is to somehow close that gap like you have the gap between big complicated questions you can't evaluate and easy questions that you can evaluate and there's this gap, you just somehow bridge it. And in fact, there are a lot of questions you can evaluate. Like another one would be uh, what factors are mentioned in the most recent clinical trial? Well, you could look at the trial and see what's a better summary of the factors. Um, so there are a lot of questions in the machine learning setting that you can trade agents on or in the human expert setting that you can evaluate experts on. And then, there are slightly more complex questions, like what factors should I consider when making that decision? Uh, for those questions, you can't directly evaluate the answers, but if you had input like from the questions you can answer, then you can make progress on those questions. So even though you can't directly evaluate the answers for those questions, if you can ask sub-questions like, well, what factors are discussed in the 10 most relevant Reddit posts, or what factors are mentioned in the most recent clinical trial, then you can better think about what factors you should consider. So you can evaluate those questions using sub-questions. And there are other questions like this um, on that level of difficulty, like how do the options compare on these factors, or given the comparisons, what decision should I make? Those are also questions you can't directly evaluate, but you can break them down, and then you're informed by the sub-questions that help you evaluate them. And so step by step, you can build up um, creating incentives for slightly more complex questions at each point until you can create good incentives for large questions that you can't directly evaluate. So that's the general scheme. We call it factored evaluation. And just to repeat what's going on is, um, you ask some questions that help you evaluate complex answers that you otherwise couldn't evaluate. You do that recursively until you bottom out at answers that are simple enough such that you can directly evaluate them yourself. All right, let's go back to the beginning. So we'd really like to kind of actually test this sort of mechanism on questions that are rep representative of the questions we care about in the long run, that have this open-ended nature, like the laser eye surgery question. This is kind of hard um, as a starting point for experiments, um, and so we want to create a kind of a model situation for that. One way you can create a model situation for that is to think, well, what, what is like the critical factor um, that we want to explore? And the critical factor, again, is there's this gap between the kind of asker of the question and the experts um, who know the big picture that the asker doesn't. So in our experiments, we create artificial experts by having people who read a long article, in this case on uh, Project Habakkuk, um, like a plan to generate an aircraft carrier out of uh, a mixture of, I think, uh, ice and concrete, was it? Uh, anyway, it was a terrible plan. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, so there are experts who read that article, and then there's a person who's asking a question about the article who doesn't get to read the article, um, and yet wants to incentivize the experts to provide answers that are as helpful as if the um, asker could evaluate them using knowledge of the article. What does it look like? I'm going to show you some screenshots from an app that we built where we're trying to explore this mechanism, factor elevation. So if you're, imagine you're a participant in our experiments then uh, you might see a question like this. According to the Wikipedia article, could Project Habakkuk have worked? And then you see two answers. The first answer might say, it would not have worked due to fundamental problems with the approach. And the other answer is, it could have worked if it had not been opposed by military commanders. Now, um, if you don't know about this project, those answers actually look like pretty similarly plausible to you. So, you're in this situation that I mentioned, where there's some big picture that you don't know about, and you, yet you want to create good incentives by picking the correct one of those two answers. Imagine in the machine learning setting, imagine those are two samples from a language model, for example, that you're trying to train. So you need to somehow pick the right answer, but you can't do it directly. What can you do? Well, uh, you can ask sub-questions that help you tease apart which of those answers is better. What do you ask? Um, one thing you can ask is, what is the best argument that the second answer is better than the first answer? I'm not saying this is the best thing to ask. That's just one thing you could ask that would help you tease apart which is better. You might get back an argument. Maybe you don't even look at the argument. Uh, then you can ask a different question, such as how strong is that argument? So you can see how using a sequence of sub-questions 
you can eventually figure out which of those answers is better without yourself understanding the big picture. Let's zoom in on the second sub-question um, to see how eventually you can bottom out. It's something that you can evaluate. So uh, again, a different, a different person might look at this workspace, as we call it, and uh, now there's a question like, how strong is that argument? The argument being, in this case, the Mythbuster showed that it's possible to build a bottom of PyCrete, which contradicts one of the answers. And again, you have like two answers. Again, possibly samples from a language model. One of the answers is, uh, it's a big argument, there's some claim that refutes it. Another answer is, it's a strong argument. And again, that's kind of, the question is too big for you, right? Like, you can't answer it directly. Um, but if you can ask questions about it. You can ask, well, if this claim that one of the answers mentions is true, does it actually refute the argument? Um, maybe you get back an answer yes. And then, is the claim true? So you can kind of break down the reasoning until you can evaluate which of the answers is better without yourself understanding what is going on in a big picture fashion. Let's zoom in on this one. So this claim, it might say something like, well, is the claim the Mythbusters only built a small boat of PyCrete? Uh, they didn't think it would work at scale, true. And then you get two answers with different quotes from the Wikipedia article. One of them says they conclude that PyCrete was bulletproof and so on. And the other says um, they built a small boat, but they doubted that you could actually build an aircraft carrier. And in that case, it's easy to choose the correct answer yourself. So in this case, the second answer is clearly the better answer. So um, step by step, we've taken a big question, turned it into a small question we can evaluate, um, and thus create a system where if we can create good incentives for the smaller question at each step, then we can bootstrap to creating good incentives for the larger question. So that's the shape um, of our current experiments. They're about re reading comprehension using articles from Wikipedia. We've also done similar experiments using magazine articles. Um, and uh, we want to expand the frontier of difficulty, which means we want, we want to better understand like, what sorts of questions does this sort of mechanism work for, if any, reliably. Um, and uh, one way we want to increase the, the, kind of the difficulty of those experiments is by increasing the gap between the person who's asking the question and the expert who is um, providing answers. So you could imagine having experts who have read an entire book that the person who's asking the question hasn't read, or experts who get to use all of Google, or experts who are real domain experts who know about physics uh, in a case where the, the asker doesn't know anything about physics. And then there's at least one more dimension in which we want to explore and, and expand the difficulty of the questions that we're looking at. So we want to make them more subjective, such as using interactive question answering or like expanding eventually to questions like, should I get laser eye surgery or wear glasses? Those are just two examples. There's really a very big space of questions and uh, kind of factors you can explore. And we want to understand which parts of the space does factor evaluation work for, which doesn't it work for, why does it work, how scalable is it? All right, let's review. So I've told you about a mechanism design problem, delegating open and cognitive work. I've told you that this problem is important because of principal agent problems with cognitive work that you face everywhere in kind of human day-to-day um, -day life and uh, with machine learning alignment. Um, I've told you that it's hard because you can't just check the results you get from experts, but you also can't check their full reasoning. So that's a tricky situation. But I've told you that it's tractable. Um, we have some ideas, factor evaluation, um, that can help us at, like, at least get some traction on it, even if they're not like, ultimately the correct solution. And we can experiment on them today with humans and see, do they work, do they not work? How could they be changed so that they work better? If you're excited about this project, join us at Art. Great, um, thanks very much. So I guess my first question is on timelines of, of progress. So. Um, yeah, I mean, what do you think about how, how long it's taking you to get this far in, in the next sort of one, five, ten years? Yeah. Um, so far, a lot of our work has been about figuring out what kinds of experiments do you need to run so that you can get any evidence on the question of interest. So I think there's a lot of ways you can run experiments that are kind of busy work where you don't actually learn about the question you care about. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it took us a lot of iteration, rough, say, six months until we ended up with the current setting. And now the game is to like, scale up, get more participants. And over the next year or so, we hope to get, like, for limited sets of questions, relatively conclusive evidence on whether the scheme can work or not. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, great. Um, and any questions from the audience? I've got nothing through yet on Bizabo, but if you can pop your hand up, I can repeat it for the mic. Yeah? Okay, so the question there was on um, incentives and experts and how the experts actually incentivize in the examples given. Yeah, so this is a subtlety I skipped over, um, which is where do the expert answers come from and how are they generated exactly? Um, in our case, one expert is told, just generate kind of a helpful answer, like read the article, try to be as accurate and honest as possible. The other expert is told, um, your goal is to trick the human judge into choosing the wrong answer. You win if you like, kind of make an answer that seems plausible but is actually fake. It's like the wrong answer. Someone, if someone read the entire article, they would clearly say this is not the right answer. Um, so they have kind of opposing incentives and are rewarded based on whether they trick the judge into accepting the wrong answer or get the judge to accept the correct answer. So is the honest actor rewarded? In the long run, that's the way to do it. At the moment, we re rely on participants just doing the right thing. <laughs> OK, great. Uh, any further questions? Uh, OK, fantastic. So can you join me in um, thanking Andreas for his time? <laughs>